What we're a part of, I think, is a, a very important uh, consciousness raising. What we need is for people to realize that we've bought into a dumb idea. What's the dumb idea? The dumb idea is that we are taking fuel out of a desert in Saudi Arabia, and we put it in a tank. It's mucky stuff. And then we hope that tank is not leaking. And then we put it into a bigger tank that floats, which we hope doesn't hit a reef. And we get it over to the United States, and we take it and put it into another tank, which we hope isn't leaking. And then we crack it and refine it. And of course, we spent a lot of energy to do that. And now it's really volatile stuff. And we put it into another tank, which we hope isn't leaking. Then we put it into another tank that has wheels, which we hope doesn't have an accident. And we take it up to our local gas station, which we hope has got tanks that don't leak. Then we take it out of those tanks, and we put it into our tank. And of course, it, we have some fumes coming out. And we're all doing this every day, right? And then we start our engines. And we get 12% of that if it's a good car, today's cars. If we get 12% of it doing our work to move us, we're lucky. Where's the rest go? Heat. The people of this planet, and especially in the USA, have started to realize that we haven't been respecting the planet. Every year there's been a new environmental disaster, starting with acid rain, global warming, CFCs and ozone depletion, gasoline in groundwater. They're nearly all attributable to the automobile. And uh, electric vehicles are the clear answer to that sort of problem. And so, uh, to my mind, with education such as we're doing with the Tour de Sol, people will say, yes, I want an electric car. The first electric car was actually built back in 1837. Their quiet, clean operation made them quite popular. It was Henry Ford's development of the electric starter for gas cars, coupled with their greater range and lower fuel costs, that put the gas car on top and the electric car out of business. Unlike the combustion engine, the electric car is really very simple. Power from the batteries is regulated through the accelerator pedal and the motor controller, which in turn sends pulses of electricity to the motor. The easiest way to acquire an electric vehicle is to convert a standard gas guzzler. This MG replica utilizes a Volkswagen frame and a light fiberglass body. Batteries under the hood supply the power, while this electric motor ties in directly to the original transmission. The American Tour de Sol is one of several races organized as a means for designers of electric vehicles to test their ideas and as a way to expose and inform the public on the advancements in this new technology. The race passes through several state capitals and gives political leaders an opportunity to throw their support behind environmental issues. Vehicles in the race are divided into several classes. Commuter cars must carry two people and stay under a weight of 1,500 pounds. Race cars are built for speed and efficiency. Many schools choose this category as a chance to verify theories and principles of engineering. Although commuter cars and the open class may plug into the power grid at night, race cars and transcontinental vehicles must use only the sun to charge their batteries. The extensive surface area dedicated to solar cells. motors come directly out of the battery or do they alternate okay between? a lot of people ask the question you know how much can how fast can you go on that solar energy with those collectors well what you have to imagine is that they're like a booster uh, 
when you're driving, you're drawing the energy out of the batteries at a far greater rate than you make it on the panels. Even these cars with the huge arrays, they're taking it out of the panels much, much faster than it's coming in, even on the brightest day. So what it is is like a booster. But the, the race is fashioned after the idea of a practical commuter car. Well, what's it mostly doing? It's mostly sitting in a parking lot because you're working. So you drive to work, and it sits. So therefore, if it's sitting, why not trickle charge the batteries back up? For eight hours, they're charging. I think the key point is that fundamentally electric vehicles will end up cheaper than gasoline vehicles, especially when you include the amount of complexity needed to control emissions in gasoline vehicles. When I was a kid, I could repair a gas vehicle. Now I open the hood and have a look and I don't even try and I've got a doctor of engineering. And with an electric vehicle, they're fundamentally very simple. They have batteries, a motor controller, and a motor and some way of connecting the power to the wheels, three parts. And uh, whereas gas vehicles will always be getting more and more complicated and thus expensive as we realize how much we've got to control of pollution, electric vehicles will remain simple. And fundamentally, they will be cheaper. Many of the participants in the Tour de Sol and other races of this type are from universities and even high schools. Building an electric car is a project that gives students enthusiasm and experience in a wide range of skills. Most high schools have a, a science department in one wing of the school and a technology department in the other wing of the school, and they seldom have anything in common. A uh, solar car project is a great way to have something in common. Uh, it's a very, uh, at a high school level, it's a very stressful project. It involves an awful lot of problem solving, an awful lot of what we call in our area critical skills. That's identifying those things we need to grow up and, and use from job to job, those interchangeable things, and use them. And there's nothing better than a solar car project to do that. Uh, it teaches teamwork, it teaches science, uh, environmental aware awareness. Um, it's the kind of thing that, that fits all our needs. It mixes boys and girls together. Um, it breaks down the barriers between the, the vocational students and the academic students. There's no barriers there. They're a very technical thing. It establishes what I call the, the need to know. In other words, I don't establish for my students, I don't ask them to know anything that they don't need to know. What they don't know when I first start this project is the project is so horrendously difficult that they're spending the entire year scrambling around trying to find all the information they need in order to do the task. But while they're doing that, it's quite clear in their minds that it's important because the car and the race and the and all the, the good things that come from it. And they leave high school with a good feeling that they have done some research in alternative energy and they would have some way of changing the world. It's, last year, the tour all started in, in Vermont, in Mount Pelier, Vermont. So we went over to Mount Pelier to see a start and we followed it for one day. And so two of the students said, you know, there's no reason we can't do that. Why don't you look into it? So we wrote some letters and phone calls and found out we really could. And we received a Chapter 2 grant to help finance it. And we had a person donate a car. It was cheaper to give it to us than to pay the junkyard to take it. And so that got us started. Yeah, at our school, we, our curric we have these curriculums that are called event-driven curriculums. And you pick an event, whatever it may be, and this is an event. Building an electric car and racing was the event. And then we try to involve as many students as we can. This event was started as a club, so any student from any, curric any level, any curriculum could join it. We had about 100 students work on it directly. Uh, it may be writing publicity for newspapers or it may be doing auto body work or design work in the drafting room or making hotel reservations for the six hotels, whatever it was. We had about 100 students. And then the rest of the school was involved in it in indirectly. The math department, would, if they needed word problems, they would use them from the problems we were working on with the car, either for the load problems or the electrical problems. Uh, English would write letters to the newspapers. The uh, history department did a little thing on the history of electric cars, and it was very surprising they've been around so many years and have faded away and are now coming back. So, the 1979 Volkswagen, which had a diesel engine in it, and it, again, it was given to us, so it was kind of the luck of the draw, but that particular car is one of the easiest cars for electrical conversion because of where the transmission and transaxles are. You don't have to move them. So we took out the, the engine and just replaced it with a motor. 
Uh, it was very, very easy. Of course, you take your gas tank out, you throw it away. You take your muffler and tailpipe off, you throw it away. You take your carburetor. You take all those things that always break on you and just throw them away. Um, the original car weighs, weighed 2,100 pounds, and with all the batteries we put in it, it weighs 2,800 pounds, so it's 700 pounds heavier. We didn't feel that we wanted to redesign the body or adjust the frame to try to make it lighter, so we made a decision way back to go with a lot of battery power and go heavy instead of going light. I think from the race we made the right decision. Most people have gone light and they can't make the hills. We went a little heavy and we're just running up the hills and gaining lots of time, so we're quite excited about that decision, which we had a little help on, but again, it was a naive decision. So we're fortunate. You, you just have to work as a team. You're going to have some arguments. <laughs> You're going to have some blue days when things don't go right. But it's really possible. I mean, there's a Conville High School is here, so that's another high school whose project is far more ambitious than ours. Uh, there was a high school in Albany that just ran for one day. They were a local New York school. So there's three high schools that are doing it. Uh, get some material. And find somebody who's done it before that will just give you free advice. We had two people, one from Boston, who especially any time we wanted to call him and ask him a question, uh, he said, just call, and we did, and he always answered us and helped us, and uh, we worked through it, and uh, we had a lot of fun. Money is not anything from the school. We had no money from the school. It was completely gotten by myself, uh, another PR student who is Nancy Brown and another PR student who is Jennifer Quinn. The three of us uh, are known as public relations on the team and we go to local businesses and we do a lot of begging. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have been pretty successful. Yes, we were. We would get uh, sometimes $2,500 from one company, sometimes as little as $5 from someone else, but it all amounted up. So finally we got enough money and enough parts donated that we got our silicon built and we're here. Go for it. Yeah, basically you just set in your mind like, I can do this. And you go out, you dress nicely, you don't dress like a slob, you have to be presentable. And you just clean up your act and you go to a business and you put all your ideas out on the table and nine times out of ten they'll listen to you. This is a 1957 BMW IZ 300 that I bought in 1963 for $10. It originally had a one-cylinder gasoline engine, a 13-horsepower gasoline engine, and uh, we felt that this was an ideal conversion uh, from a gasoline-powered car to a, a, an electric car. And so we put in a 12-horsepower Selectria three-phase AC motor, and our battery pack is consists of 11 50-amp-hour gel, uh, power gel cells. Uh, we chose gel cells primarily for their safety, uh, not for necessarily for their energy density, because energy density you can do better with these uh, deep cycle marine batteries. But um, as far as safety is concerned, uh, that was our primary concern during the construction of the whole car. I mean, it's not a good idea to have a car that goes like mad but isn't very safe, especially if somebody gets hurt with it. And so far, there's no, there's, there's, nobody's gotten hurt with anything. Um, even in the event of an accident, uh, these batteries, even if they're broken, the worst that will come out of them is a paste as opposed to um, sulfuric acid all over the place like a regular car. What would, uh, how would you advise another school that was wanting to get involved in a project like this? Yeah, that's a great question. The best bit of advice I can give to anybody wishing to become involved in the Tour de Sol or any of the other events is to get a small group of representatives and send them around, do exactly what we did. That um, little trip last year, helping out with Nessie, sweeping, running around, doing whatever uh, the race officials uh, needed to be done uh, as a volunteer, saved us thousands and thousands of dollars in development costs and also um, in reliability. I mean, because we saw what broke down on other cars we saw what worked very, very well, and we saw what didn't work well, so we knew what not to do. And that's Engine. important is knowing what to do. Where do you get your funding? 
Okay, we had funding uh, that came several ways. The first was uh, the students actually were soliciting support with local businesses and local merchants. Uh, car supply house, for example, turned about to be uh, very interested in us, and they supplied a lot of components for nothing, which is great. Um, also, the faculty. Uh, there seemed to be a fair amount of support right from the school internally. We had a, uh, an adopt a watt button that was selling, you know, for a small fee, but, you know, it, it, it all added up. Uh, the big support came from the governor's energy office, and we were able to get two years' worth of money on this last project. Uh, we actually had enough funding to support the, the whole project for two years. Uh, that meant a lot to us because it allowed us to get some quite good components for the vehicle and make a substantial improvement for this year. Well, how would you recommend School One to get started? What would you recommend they do? Okay, hey, we were talking about that. Uh, what I would recommend is that they make a point of looking at what's been done, what's the present state of the art, what has been accomplished already so that they can get up to speed quickly. No sense kind of reinventing things that have already been done and very well developed. Uh, or going into areas th uh, or that could lead to disaster or difficulty. Uh, and it's a, there's many aspects of it. For example, uh, the right kind of photovoltaic cells is one whole area to study. Uh, the right kind of steering system, uh, the right kind of uh, controller system, right kind of motor systems are, they can take it into components, study those components, and look at the components in the various vehicles and see how they're constructed, and then they can see what they might be able to do. There has to be some decent funding, probably going to need twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to get into this. I think that's a fair estimate. You know, there could be lower prices uh, to get into it. We, we did it quite low the first year, but, and it's because we did a lot uh, on our own, we constructed our own controller. But it was not, it was good, but it was not quite as good as you need to be in the game now. Uh, so we need, you need really good equipment. Uh, and it may depend on the school itself. If some school is particularly well equipped in a particular aspect of it, let's say the electronics, then they might be able to save themselves uh, three to five thousand dollars worth of expense by doing that. But some equipment you must buy, and, and you can't get around them, such as the photovoltaic cells. You really can't make those, so you have to buy them. It's, it's the best kind of learning, because you make mistakes, and you, you, you brush them off and say, try it again, and keep trying, and keep trying until you get it right. They made a lot of mistakes, but uh, we're here. So far, there's uh, nothing but positive you're going to gain from it. Uh, a lot of hard work. Be ready for the challenge, but you'll come out of it. You know, learning and knowing and meeting more people and learning more things than you can ever imagine. In order to meet the world's transportation needs, it is essential that electric-powered vehicles go beyond the realm of experimentation and enter the process of mass production. Selectria of Arlington, Massachusetts, and Solar Car Corporation of Melbourne, Florida represent two of the many companies working to fulfill this important goal. MIT graduate James Warden started Selectria with a group of fellow classmates. Their cars have consistently taken first place in the Tour de Sol commuter category, establishing them as a major supplier for parts and components used in the assembly of electric vehicles. We believe that the edge is, um, is uh, we have an edge because of our electric drive components. Um, they're extremely efficient, they're uh, reliable, and um, I think also our, our project team is extremely competent. So we get, to, we get our act together, hope, fortunately also at the last minute if we have to, and um, we can coordinate things well, and we have enough people who, are, who can do the job and do it well. People in our company are extremely motivated by what they see as the end goal, um, getting electric vehicles out and solving a lot of the pollution problems. What I'd like to see is um, when the school students, high school and college students get involved, that that be their motivation too. Um, it's an extremely uh, amazing engineering opportunity to be able to build these vehicles. Um, however, 
the motivation is lost if people don't realize what the goal is. The goal is to get electric vehicles out, to get solar-powered vehicles, vehicles that don't produce any emissions. And um, I think that in itself can be what motivates people a little bit further, get a team together to get the coordination and the technical expertise together to actually build a car that's successful. Solar Car Corporation's Doug Cobb and Dr. Robert Adams have concentrated on producing affordable conversions engineered for performance and safety. Their projects range from the small, all-electric Ford Festiva to the hybrid-fueled Chevy Lumina designed as a mass transit vehicle. Each car that you convert has to be engineered properly to make sure you're not overloading the suspension system, that you're not uh, placing the batteries in a, in, a, in a place where the weight distribution affects the handling of the car or the braking of the car. Um, so we've tried to standardize. The less cars we convert, the more our engineering can go to do a better job of the ones we do. Uh, it basically, theoretically, any car can be converted, and it's just a matter of the engineering time that has to go into each individual project to make sure that those criteria are met so it's a safe conversion. What we have here is an adapter plate. We have this cast, and it's designed to fit between the existing car transmission and the electric motor, as I showed you before. Now, in this shot, you can see the electric motor, how it's coupled into the uh, adapter plate which is a transition between it and the existing transmission. This is the electronic speed controller module. This is a new state-of-the-art MOSFET design. Uh, this little black box is what interfaces the power from the batteries into the electric motor. Uh, what controls it is this rheostat control over here, which acts like a volume control knob on an amplifier. As you step on the gas of the car, it pulls this lever over, and that's what turns on and off this electronic amplifier to give power to the motor. Okay, what you can see here in a little bit of closer detail is we have a battery pack. This is part of the battery pack. There's five six-volt batteries here. Now, this car, we are utilizing 120 volts, so we have a total of 20 six-volt batteries. Five are in the front here and 15 more in the back, which I'll show you in the back bed. Obviously, we have this one small 12-volt battery here, and this acts as the 12-volt system battery for the lights, the horn, the controls, and so forth. Uh, what we've added, we've put this box in, which is a DC to DC converter, and this is a sub-fuse box. We take the total of 120 volts coming off the battery pack, and we run it through this uh, DC to DC converter, which then uh, charges the 12-volt battery and supplements the 12 volts that's necessary. Here is our speed controller. As I said before, this is kind of the heart of the electronics where we have uh, heavily heat synced for uh, cooling. It's in the front of the vehicle for air uh, heat dissipation with the airflow coming in through the grill. And then up in this section here, we've got the contactors and fusible links and so forth. This, this system here is designed so we can undo two screws and this modular control board slides out for servicing. We have a battery uh, a plug like this so you can Basically, you've got two plugs here that are color-coded. Uh, the gray one goes for the motor, and the red one is for the battery. So by plugging them in, you've basically uh, completed the system. There's a few other wires that go for the uh, ignition switch and so forth, but they're kind of minor. Uh, it's hard to see it from that angle, but over here we have a vacuum reservoir can, and underneath we have a vacuum pump, and this is how we supplement the uh, vacuum system. On the normal brake system for this vehicle, you have a diaphragm here, which is your vacuum brake assist. And because we no longer have an engine creating a vacuum, we put this little canister, a vacuum pump, and electrical switch. So as the brake system needs a vacuum, the switch and the canister keep up with the demand. Okay, what we've done here is we've cut open the inside floor pan of the car. Then we've reinforced the chassis and frame by putting in some beam construction here. Uh, then this composite built battery box slides down into this to give us a low center of weight to keep the batteries down low and to keep them in front of the front axle where we get a better weight distribution. And what we have here is a lid. This lid, composite lid, then fits and folds down over the battery box. So that, that creates a nice compartment there that will structurally keep the batteries in and uh, we feel give us a better center uh, weight distribution for handling in the car and for safety also. 
What you see here, this is an 86 Honda station wagon we converted. This is one of our first conversions we did. In fact, we did this and entered it into the American Tour de Sol in 1990 and took first place in the open class division. It's cool. Uh, we really stole the show with the inlay of the solar panels the way we did it. Uh, we had these panels custom built for us and tried to cover as much of the roof of the car, including the spoiler. And one of the things you might be able to pick up is a compound curve we have in both directions, this way across the top of the car and in this direction. And it was important for us to try to keep the aesthetics of these cars as, as streamlined as possible. Our early cars used the flat solar panels that looked like we were carrying tables everywhere. Now what we've got under the hood is a little different, but uh, on this one we not only have batteries, there's more batteries in the back of the car, but we have a small engine. This puts out about six horsepower. It's actually a lawnmower engine. And uh, we were using this for experimental purposes to uh, test some theories we had. And this uh, six horsepower engine will drive this car at over 3,000 pounds at about 40 miles an hour. Um, so we were very impressed in, uh, with how much, how little power it really takes to move a car. So as I explained earlier, with the hybrid, we're using the electric motor, which is down under here for the real brute torque of acceleration. And we use the uh, internal combustion engine for cruising once we're up to speed. And it's a very nice combination. For our planet to survive, it is essential that we end our dependence on fossil fuels. In today's world, the automobile stands as a symbol of the individual's quest for personal freedom, yet at the same time, it is perhaps the greatest threat to our environment and world peace. The electric car represents a major step down a new path, the herald of a much needed change in technology and awareness that will carry us into the next century.